I'm going to review two 1995 PC video game demos. Not really the games, just the demos. You see, like many nerds who grew up with only a PC, my gaming experience was basically wet garbage. If you had a PC instead of an SNES in 1994, sure, you might have had Doom, and you were proud of it if you did, but you didn't have Sonic, and you didn't have Super Mario World, and you didn't even have Bubsy. If you had an allowance and a game console, you could go down to the video rental store just about every week and get something with your money that you could put in your game console, press buttons, and have corresponding actions appear on screen. The PC was not really like this in a lot of different ways, partly because the software was just garbage. I mean, yes, I have fond and incorrect memories of the PC as well, but frankly, the games that came out for it were deeply disappointing compared to anything that anyone was playing on the SNES or even NES. You also couldn't rent games for PC. You had to buy them outright, which makes the final problem even worse, and that is most households that only had a PC for gaming probably weren't spending much money on games anyway. Your parents probably bought a PC for them to use, and you got to use it when they weren't using it. So if you had a sound card, you were lucky, and if you had more than one or two actual retail games, you were even luckier, even if one of them was Doom. Instead of a shoebox full of cartridges and a new rental every week, you probably just had one of these. If you're not familiar, these discs were basically scams. They were huge collections of games copied off of public FTPs, websites, and other discs of the same sort, compiled and stamped onto a disc with, at best, some sort of rudimentary launcher to copy them to your hard drive. The fly-by-night scumbags who put these together didn't care in the least about quality. They just gathered up all this free stuff, stamped it on a disc, maybe had a box printed up, and then sold it in egghead software for pure profit. This was sort of the intent of the shareware system that had become popular in the 90s for distributing game demos. However, it also meant that pretty much every kid had two to six of these things, which we hated as much as we loved. The one I most remember was called A Thousand and One Great Games, and yes, this title did contain an egregious lie, the word great, but it nonetheless had a thousand and one folders, each one containing some executable program. A thousand of anything is basically impossible for a 12-year-old to consume in any structured fashion, and sure enough, instead of playing one game after another until I had checked them all out, I skipped around the folder, jumped from here to there, went backwards through the items, and so on until I had completely forgotten where I was so many times that I was guaranteed essentially endless days of box of chocolate style exploration, with the understanding that the majority of these chocolates did have trash filling. These discs would typically have demos of whatever the AAA equivalents of the day were, Commander Keen, Doom, and everything from Apogee and Epic Mega Games, but those were numbered in the dozens at the best. They were the cream of the crop, and you quickly went through those and were left with the rest. The remaining dozens or hundreds of titles were invariably gutter slime. You could expect to find hacked copies of Wolfenstein 3D, awful platformers that ran way too fast, and a dozen variations of Hangman from the early CGA years of the IBM PC. Some games wouldn't run, and some were Mahjong. These collections were atrocious, careless, and largely unfun, but they were extremely cheap, and it beat playing Gorilla's Bass, so we took what we could get. In between the A-grade titles and the slime, there were, of course, games that were interesting. I mean, some were very interesting, like Metal and Lace, the terrible Japanese fight game that ostensibly had very naked anime ladies in it if you played it well enough. I don't think anyone knew that was on the disc. My parents certainly didn't, and I doubt the vendor even checked to see if any of the games ran before sending them off to be pressed. For my part, I lacked the competence to ever see those illicit body parts and the internet to tell me they were there, so that was some kind of bullet dodged, but I sure did spend a long time thinking about how the title screen of that game made me feel, although that might have just been because that was the first time I had ever seen anime. But I digress. As confusingly interesting as that game was, I'm talking about games that were bafflingly fascinating. One that I think about constantly is Fade to Black, an early entry in the over-the-shoulder third-person action-adventure exploration shooter genre, which you could describe as what if Metal Gear Solid played like Tomb Raider, but bad. 
I didn't find out until my mid-20s that this was actually a PlayStation game that had been ported to PC, and while I don't think either the PSX original or the full PC version were good, they were at least not terrifying visions of the abyss. See, if you played either of those versions, they came with an intro movie, kept me in a deep sleep was suddenly interrupted. I came to and opened my eyes. And voice clips that explained the story and what you were doing. You never should have left yourself. The demo had none of these. Instead, you were simply dumped into an earth-toned jail cell, thrust into a denimed man's body, and made to explore his predicament in third person while saddled with what is, I promise, the strangest camera you've ever seen. Imagine playing Tomb Raider, but with the camera permanently pitched down 15 degrees, so that at nearly all times you feel like you're in one of those public restrooms with the angled mirrors that give you motion sickness. You can never see the ceiling, a fascinating decision in a game where things come out of the ceiling. This extremely neck pain inducing camera angle is immutable except when it's interrupted by random jumps to fixed position Resident Evil cameras, which make no sense in a fully 3D game. You quickly learn that this world is dim and unknowable. Walls just a few feet away fade to gray. Enemies morph in and out. You find yourself getting shot at from God knows where, and your unspeaking character's sluggish animation priority tank controls keep you constantly five seconds behind your mysterious opposition. Assuming, of course, you can figure out how to move at all. The demo I downloaded for this review seems to come with a readme file that contains the controls, but I don't remember having that in my copy as a kid, probably because the people who made these compilation discs were incompetent scum bags. It wasn't uncommon for games to not include the README, and this was a problem. Since PC games were played almost exclusively with keyboard, game controls could be bound to any of over 100 keys, not to mention modifiers like control and shift, so the chances you could figure out all the controls of a game were jack squat. In fact, while writing this review, I learned for the first time that Fade to Black has a map, which I would have found infinitely pleasing as a kid, although I would then have been infinitely upset by the alternate control scheme I found in the README as well. This game is generally in the Tomb Raider mold. Arrow keys steer your character left and right, up makes him run forward, and down makes him crouch. That's right, if you step into a room and start getting obliterated by enemy bullets, you can't back up. You have to turn around and run out of the room with your back to the enemy. Really, this game is a treasure. To be completely honest, you can back up, but you do it by pressing zero on the numpad, and your character then performs the tiniest, daintiest back step. So that's worse. Like Tomb Raider, you do have to manually draw your gun to fight, but unlike Tomb Raider, this is a graceless process that takes too long and the input doesn't buffer. So if you're in motion, you have to hammer the draw button until your guy finishes moving, all the while watching yourself get pummeled by bastard guns. This is a far cry from Tomb Raider's smoothly integrated animations, which allowed Miss Raider to draw her weapons while performing a backwards snake heap somersault 180. To add various insults, you have to reload manually when your tiny magazine is empty, and tapping the normal movement inputs during combat will undraw your weapon and throw you into a two second run animation. If you want to reposition yourself, you have to remember the second set of movement keys, which are one, three, and slash on the numpad. All this means that in your initial forays, enemy encounters will begin with a mad struggle to remember how to get your gun out, followed by flailing attempts to aim as your panic level skyrockets, finishing with your character dying pathetically as you slap the hammer on an empty chamber. Even after you notionally get good at the game, you will probably take damage in every encounter. The PlayStation version is less confusing simply because the gamepad has fewer inputs. There are only eight buttons that could reasonably trigger actions, so things like sidestep don't require any key combo nonsense, instead being quite understandably mapped to the shoulder buttons. Unfortunately, since there were virtually no PC controllers at this time with enough buttons for contemporary games, the keyboard was as good as it got, despite being utterly unintuitive. Lots of PC games had terrible controls, but that was just background radiation for the platform. We all accepted the keyboard as a terrible but universal input device. So imagine my surprise when I learned that Delphine Software, in an incredible act of what is now called Eurojank, included not one, but two baffling mouse input modes, one of which is point and click. When you press Control M to enable mouse mode, a floating UI appears in the style of a modern Android game. The density of this interface makes PUBG Mobile look as approachable as Super Mario Brothers. 
This company discovered new dimensions, pun intended, of awkward 3D motion controls. You have to click on tiny arrows to do everything, to move your character forward, to turn, to draw your weapon and fire. Everything has a little icon in this cute but unparsable style. So to reload, you have to remember to click on the narrow to run and then watch your character not mimic the portrayed action. Several icons are utterly unintelligible, like inventory or save. And even in the places where you'd think the mouse might help, it doesn't. For example, the only clue you're given in this demo about the nature of the world is some kind of email, presumably from a compatriot, which the game tells you about as soon as it begins, but doesn't tell you how to read it. You can press any button you like, and it won't come up. Even if you figure out how to enter the inventory, the message isn't selected by default. You may discover that pressing tab will cycle categories until you see the message, but still, no amount of entering or spacing bar will read it. The trick that you have to learn is to press right shift. And there's nothing right about that. While you might expect the mouse to improve this situation, no amount of lefting, writing, or middling on the note will do squat. You in fact have to click this unlabeled circle in the decorative picture at the bottom. The second mouse input mode is in the README called Pro Mode, which implies that Delphine Software imagined some kind of pre-QuakeCon eSport. With this setting, the mouse much more directly controls the player character, allowing you to analogly pan from side to side. Camera pitch, however, is still inaccessible, the y-axis of the mouse doing nothing at all, making it painfully clear that not being able to look comfortably forward was a design decision that Delphine believed in passionately for God knows what reason. Even without knowing about the ghastly mouse controls, this game legitimately upset me as a kid with its intensely difficult gameplay, intensely threatening atmosphere, and utter lack of context that might have been offered by a manual, an intro, or any hint of intelligible human communication. For instance, in the full version, upon exiting your cell, you'll overhear an announcement that the prisoner has escaped. But this has been removed from the demo, so upon exiting, you have no idea that anyone is upset at your actions. You just see this cryptic symbol moments before a floating robot bastard shoots you in the face. It turns out this glyph is meant to show you the direction of an enemy that's sizing you up, a band-aid for the incredible difficulty of navigating the game. Since you can't readily do what all real-world combat training suggests and check your corners, the game offers you this little bit of ESP to let you know that a bastard is fixing to murk you. If you manage to counter-murder this robotic terror and exit to the next room, you immediately encounter what one might describe as a tone poem about war, a Hideo Kojiman fever dream about a Metal Gear yet to be invented. A tiny hallway circumscribes a pedestal, a miniature Elon Musk in Hyperloop built, as with the real thing, to accommodate just one vehicle, and that vehicle is, as they will also often be in reality, stuck firmly in place. A green force field prevents it from moving forward, while a red one prevents you from moving forward. Stepping on the red marker will open the red force field, but the tank will then laser you into oblivion. The trick here is to allow the tiny tank through the green field on your way to the red one so that as it trundles forth, the miniature aggressor inadvertently allows your passage. What purpose this room serves diegetically is anyone's guess. The little tank certainly seems like an ineffective guardian, to put it mildly. You can blow the turret off the tank if you want, but all you're doing is exposing yourself to risk for no benefit, since it costs nothing to simply walk over the green pad, wait one second, and then exit unlasered. The next room serves to disown you of any preconceptions you might have had that you were starting to understand the gameplay loop. As you enter, you hear a beeping that, despite the lack of moving objects, clearly announces an impending attempt on your life. If you're quick, or have died here several times already, you might think to pull out your gun. The strange yellow object to the right of the door ahead will acquire a target reticle, and shooting it will knock it off the wall. The beeping continues, however, and a previously unseen turret pops down and commits a Class A felony on you, uninterrupted by any bullets you might throw its way. You can unload on this thing futilely, and perhaps this is the moment when you connect with the idea that all shootable things in this game must have reticles, evidenced by this unreticled thing clearly being unshootable. This revelation warms you with video game mechanic learning dopamine for a hot moment before you perish. It took me, at the time of this review, 10 loops through this room before I cottoned to the trick. It took me so long that I finally looked up a video of someone else playing the game and was shocked to see that their turret never popped down at all, which in turn led me to discover that the demo starts on medium difficulty, but if you uncover the cleverly hidden main menu and start a new game on easy, shooting that yellow thing does prevent the turret from coming down. 
This didn't explain why killing it wasn't working for me, so after several more loops on medium difficulty, I chose to punish the yellow thing for not rescuing me, and after several more bullets, it exploded a second time. And this time, the turret remained lifeless. It turns out that after your first round, the reticle remains, but shrinks so that you can barely see it, leading you to discount the yellow object as the corpse of a once relevant machine, when in fact, its animated tumbling meant nothing. The exact moment this feeling of frustrated triumph hits, a new green bastard materializes in the nook at the end of the room to piss on your parade, forcing you to pivot and attempt to unmake him, assuming you didn't blast all your bullets into the yellow object in your frustrated triumph, in which case you will now forget how to reload and perish again. This is probably the point where the unforgivable camera work comes into ironic focus, since you have no idea what just happened. Due to the bizarrely inclined angle, all you know is that three vaguely defined things in the upper 40 pixels of your viewport failed to stand still, prompting you to respond with the only agency a gun-equipped video game character has, but your motives are obscure. What did your man see that prompted him to up his body count, and whose bodies were they? You can at least approach the turret to understand its countenance, but the green bastard and the yellow thing were both evaporated by your prowess, never having shown themselves as more than a few pixels of distant VGA. Certainly at this point you've already learned that if you try to get close to something, your curiosity will be exchanged for blood, so unless you want to reload and take another death solely so you can get your eyes on whatever you just killed, you'll be remaining in the dark about your captors and just about everything else, since the game continues apace, as far as I've seen, with the same trial and error and error and error and error and error and error gameplay style. By the time you make it through the cafeteria back room littered with electric shock pads, only to discover you don't have enough health to make it back past the turret in the hallway and have to restart, you'll likely be finished with this electronic gaming experience for good. This demo was thoroughly unfun and legitimately upsetting to me as a child, but in the fullness of time and version, I've learned that had I owned the real game, it would have righted at least a small number of these wrongs. The full version contains vocal samples, which allow you to understand much more about the game world. For instance, that you're a prisoner. Prisoner 6 has escaped. And that you should never have left your cell. You never should have left your cell. These apply a much-needed personality to the game, giving some sort of identity to the creatures you're pummeling. It also puts a human voice on your email companion, which makes the game feel more like a poorly rendered but nonetheless living world, rather than the empty limbo that the demo suggests. Obviously, these sounds and the intro cinematic were cut from the demo out of sheer necessity. You never could have fit them on a floppy disk, so they had to go, but why they couldn't have been replaced with on-screen text is anyone's guess. That said, even the full sound pack doesn't really solve the problem that this game feels undermade. The controls are irreparable, the music leaves everything to be desired, and the graphics are so bland, they're allergic to adjectives, which is particularly true of your character. While texture-mapped polygons were very new technology on the PC at this time, this game predating both Tomb Raider and Quake, what they did choose to put textures on seems surprising. Conrad, for that is the name of the player character, is an anonymous lump of walking putty with little definition beyond his Arthur Morgan motion physics. The simple guru shading used for his character model gives him no personality. I mean, Lara Croft Tomb Raider was also Garo shaded, but she at least had eyes. Surely Conrad rated a pair of peepers, or even a mouth, but apparently Delphine felt that their hero's face took second chair to cafeteria slop. This is a strange decision, in a game full of strange decisions that all add up to something that I can't imagine wanting to play. If anybody does like a Unity update of this thing with better mouse controls, let me know. I'd love to see the second level. In its defense, the Fade to Black demo at least portrays what appears to be a video game. It looks punishingly hard, with incredibly frustrating motion and a camera that randomly chooses to turn away from the bastards you're trying to de-blood to instead show Conrad getting obliterated, but the demo does at least seem to imply that if you put enough tears and reloads into the final game, it will eventually show you an ending screen. This was less true for Cyberbikes, another 3D game that showed up on a lot of these compilation discs with a lot less going for it. 
Vehicular combat was one of the first genres to offer a fast 3D polygonal action video game experience on a modern personal computer in the form of Spectre, a battle zone like for the Macintosh, which used flat shaded polygons in an arcade arena to simulate a battle between abstract future tanks. Cyberbikes seems to me like an attempt to update Spectre in turn for the more powerful computers of 1995. Where Spectre portrayed a Tron-like space void occupied only by tanks, power-ups, and the occasional paintball field obstacle textured with confetti or satellite imagery, Cyberbikes portrays an infinite grassland littered with motorcycles, power-ups, turrets, hills, trees, wheat, houses, fences, and other Katamari Damacy aggregate. Boy, I would kill to roll a Katamari through this game. And it could take it, too, because the primary defining feature of Cyberbikes is that it's really, really big. This is the in-game map of the region it calls Warwick at full extents. This blinking dot is my vehicle, and you can see it's barely moving. I am, in fact, moving as fast as I can, so this should give you an idea of the scale. It takes a complete calendar minute at full tilt to make it across the world. There's several maps this size, and this is one of the simpler ones. The objectives aren't simple, though. In fact, I barely know what they are. There's no list of goals on your screen and none to be found in any menus. There are no waypoints, no bosses, in fact, no enemies that stand out at all. Nothing to interact with and no obvious path forward. In Warwick, for instance, there is a gigantic castle dominating the map, which seems important, but there's no way into it. There are no apparent tasks. All you know is that you're in a huge square arena with many things you can shoot and many things shooting at you. It's very hard to do the former and very hard to avoid the latter, but there's little else to do, so that's what you do. Your bike is equipped with a machine gun and a rocket launcher. Like many early vehicular combat games, these seem extremely difficult to use. You can only fire the direction you're moving, so aiming is excruciating. The enemy bikes are constantly moving at high velocity, usually in tight circles, so you can't possibly catch up with them unless they decide to take a run straight at you, in which case they'll be in and out so fast you can't even imagine shooting back. If you play this game enough, you'll figure out some tactics for occasionally popping one of these vehicles, and eventually you'll probably manage to kill one or two. You may even discover that holding the control key allows you to look around with the mouse freely, and if you're extremely lucky, you may further discover that you can fire your weapons in any direction while doing so. I discovered this for the first time by accident 25 years after I first played this game while writing this review. It took that long because the fire key is bound to your middle mouse button, and in 1995, I didn't have one of those! The ability to fire in multiple directions arguably makes it easier to assault enemies, especially ones that aren't directly on the ground, but even if you fixate on the ground bastards, you realize quickly that there are way too many of them for killing them all to be your objective. Your bike has a radar system which overlays the screen at all times, and you'll occasionally become aware of a swarm of red dots moving across the map, a half dozen to a dozen strong. One glance at your paltry 500 bullets, and it's clear that you will never be able to eradicate even the bikes, let alone the host of other mechanical bastards who never, ever stop trying to execute you for a single second. To explain this, I'll describe a phenomenon that I've observed in a number of early 3D shooters, which I call Hit Scan Hell. In several 3D games from the 90s, such as Rise of the Triad or Tech War, enemies can shoot at you the microsecond that you enter their line of sight. They're 100% accurate, very hard to locate, and often number in the dozens, such that simply stepping out of cover results in your instantly being punished by hundreds of bullets from guns you can't see. Cyberbikes suffers from most of this problem with the saving grace that it doesn't actually use hitscans, so if you keep moving, you probably won't take that much damage since the AI isn't smart enough to lead. Nonetheless, this game still has the double H nature. Every single enemy on the map is aware of you at all times and are permanently locked in hunt mode. If you enter their line of sight, they immediately open up on you. Bikes will go into wild spirals trying to light you up with minigun lead. Turrets sprinkled all over the map will blast at you from extreme distances, often with rockets, and an ever-present pair of indestructible helicopters will surround you with incessant rotor noise as they beam lasers down from the heavens. If you stop moving for even a moment, you will be drenched to the bone in lead and high explosives. But even if you don't, the symphony of machine gun reports, ricochets, and laser zaps is interminable. It begins when you enter the denser areas of the map and only really diminishes if you drive way out to the boonies, on the outskirts where the Windows flower box screensaver denotes the border of the play area. You become aware after some hours that you are exploring a nonsense world. 
There is nothing to do. As you ride, you find items from time to time, but this is pure luck. There are no markers for them on the map, and most simply get you back to where you began by replenishing ammo, armor, and fuel. These item symbols are straightforward, natural, familiar. Others are not, and confer unclear benefits. At first glance, you may think this game is meant to mimic objective reality, and perhaps even follow its rules. After all, Warwick hosts a village, a castle, and watchtowers, which hint at an internal logic we can understand, but a visit to Mexico City disillusions this. The entire map is a theme park of ludicrous ramps and platforms hanging in midair, an abandoned metropolis of wicked loops and sick jumps, as if Sonic the Hedgehog built a would-be boomtown right before the new interstate was cancelled. You can drive around this place for hours, trust me, I have, and seemingly never take the same ramp twice, but all of this adds up to nothing since it's not clear what you're supposed to be doing. When I played the demo, the only documentation I could find was a list of controls which didn't explain why I was using them or what I was meant to accomplish. The game itself offers little help. After skipping four to six pages of imaginary newspaper clippings just to reach the main menu, entering your name, then having to skip even more pages of info dump exhibition, the player, especially if they're 12 years old, is unlikely to want to read even more scrolling text before they can even see what the game is like, so they're likely to not notice the mission briefing. Even if one does catch the tiny scrap of text flickering across the screen as they irritatedly keyboard smash their way into a session, it offers breathtakingly useless information. Warwick and Mexico City are the two maps in the demo, and the briefing for each contains no goals. Warwick tells you there are elite enemy bikes and how to recognize them, but it doesn't say if your mission is to destroy them or if this is just a friendly warning. Mexico City gives no information whatsoever except to tell you that the map is some kind of alien roadside picnic, a story I'm sure they chose after they designed it. In the over two decades that I've been aware of and occasionally revisited this game, I never figured out what I was actually supposed to do in it. I'm sure the manual explains, but I never found a copy. However, with some egg on my face, I just discovered while writing this review that the game folder contains another file that I never read, despite it being named read.me. So, shame on my 12-year-old self. While it never says in so many words what the goal is, you can read between the lines to get some idea of it. So, let's take this game from the top. Cyberbikes is a non-linear, story-based, action arcade motorcycle combat simulator in which you can visit various maps in any order to either collect or destroy various unspecified MacGuffins, and after collecting or destroying enough of them, the game declares you the winner of the current mission tier and escalates you to the next, where the maps become tougher and more interesting. For instance, the Warwick briefing states that you shouldn't enter the castle, but it is there and there are many things inside of it, which you can discover right away if you buy the jump pack for your bike, which allows you to hop the front gate and become trapped inside. Riding around in there, you find enough items and structures to become convinced that at some later date, after completing several mission tiers, an objective will become available inside the castle. Also, the back of the game box describes weapons that aren't available at the outset, even in the full version, and the readme describes a key that's useful only when flying, suggesting that at some point your bike will obtain that skill. So with this info from the readme, it becomes clear that this is not just a motorcycle combat sandbox, but that there is some kind of progression mechanic here, that eventually the game might even say, congratulations, you won, but it fails still to tell us exactly what that progression mechanic is. For instance, it tells us that the green dots that appear on the radar overlay are actually the objectives, but doesn't explain what they look like. So your only option is to crisscross the entire massive game world over and over, trying to find them and then figure out what they look like while under continuous unrelenting bullet hell assault. I think even if I'd found this readme as a child, I never would have had the patience to track down all these mysterious objects to eradicate or collect. And the frustrating thing about this is, now having seen the full version, it turns out that some missions just tell you what to do. For instance, Blakedown's briefing tells you very directly to destroy a military base, kill the local commander, and steal some data. I completed this mission in under five minutes, and it was fun! All I had to do was parachute in, blow up some turrets, get an upgraded gun, kill a really easy boss, and then shoot a floating bomb until the whole base exploded. It was badass! Then I rode to the only other structure on the map, drove over some secret documents, and after 25 years and 5 minutes, I was presented with the words, Mission Complete. George Bush Mission Accomplished, I have to. I was presented with the words, Mission Complete. I went to the menu and selected Complete Mission, and some actual human language popped up congratulating me and 
offering me a weapon upgrade. I spent most of my life remembering this game as this empty, soulless thing with no spark of life in it, just dry, fake newspaper articles and dead-eyed motorcycles driving in circles. Suddenly, it's a video game, and it makes sense in the context of 1995. Mind you, even in the full version, there are problems beyond the impenetrability. The gameplay is still disastrous. I went back to Warwick, armed with the knowledge that objectives were out there, and sure enough, I did find some here and there, but they are incredibly tedious to track down, and I only found a couple before giving up. Finding ammo and armor when you need them is nearly impossible due to the size of the maps, hitting enemies is nearly impossible even knowing how to mouse aim, and jumping on the platforms is nearly impossible without extremely precise motion skills. The physics are embarrassing even for the era. The bike moves like a shadow warrior forklift. It has no inertia, you can't handbrake turn, and if you run into a tree at full tilt, it doesn't fall down and it doesn't hurt you. You just stop dead. Thud! 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 Your bike doesn't make any kind of engine noises, just the occasional tire screech or strange rustling noise, but randomly and inappropriately, when you go off a really steep ramp, a disembodied voice will shout, Yee-haw! It would be inadequate to say this game feels unfinished or low quality. Rather, it feels like it's the wrong generation, like it's closer to the early 80s Atari games that it's indirectly cloning than to the aspirational dooms or marathons that then set the tone of the 3D action genre. In fact, while I said this wasn't just a motorcycle sandbox, maybe it's easier to think of it in those terms, and in comparison to the best known one of those at this time, Excite Bike for the NES. That game is purportedly about motocross, but I can assure you, it having been one of the few NES games I did own as a kid, that it's really about going around in a circle, simply enjoying the pleasure of interacting with a motorcycle and going off big jumps. Most of the enjoyment I ever had in Cyberbikes was also basically interacting with a motorcycle and going off jumps, but if I'd had the full version, it's very likely I would have enjoyed another feature that these two games have in common. Excite Bike was a very simplistic game, which you could see in its entirety in the space of about two minutes, but it extended the attention span of young players with an edit mode, where you could make your own courses out of prefab objects, and then, at least in the Japanese version, share that course with friends. Surprisingly, Cyberbikes has this as well. The construction mode, available from the main menu, is almost certainly the exact utility they use to build all the maps in the game, so following in the footsteps of id Software and deepening those prints for 3D Realms to stride through, Cyberbikes includes its own modding tools. The editor is extremely sophisticated and has a steep learning curve, but just glancing at the list of tools will reveal incredible features, like a ramp builder which automatically interpolates the necessary sloped components, an otherwise extremely tedious task in a game full of ramps, or the selection box which allows you to lasso a group of objects and duplicate them. Had this game become popular, this level editor would have been considered shit hot. The most interesting thing about this mode, however, is that it appears to let us take a sneak peek at the later levels of the game. When you start, only six levels are available to play, but it turns out the game comes with a total of 19, and flipping through them, one is impressed by what appears to be much greater depth than was at first obvious. At some point, the player will apparently travel to a rendition of New York City on a map far less abstract than those of the demo, with realistically proportioned buildings, rotating doors, and a blue-colored ground which might suggest that the city was swallowed by the sea. Out to the east, a suburb lurks, complete with driveways, picket fences, and a lovingly modeled freeway. Another map suggests the player will visit Atlantis, and here we see the developers did the opposite of blowing their wad too soon. The 3D Minecraftian clouds that float overhead are great flavor that would have added to the maps in this demo much as butter does popcorn. Why they held out on including this kind of nuance in the demo, I can't imagine. It adds literally another dimension to literally the atmosphere. And speaking of atmosphere, there's even evidence that the player would eventually visit the moon. A lunar base lovingly rendered in the 90s style put my opinion of this game over the top. From a critical standpoint, I don't care nearly as much whether a game is good or even fun as whether the creators were reaching for the stars, as they've clearly done here. For whatever it might have been worth, Fade to Black was not that novel a game. Its poor mechanics can be explained by it not having any predecessors to crib from as many later games would. In fact, I think it might have been the first third-person action adventure ever made, so some roughness can be forgiven. 
But I think that the genre was a foregone conclusion in 1995, an obvious next step in a lot of ways, whereas globe-trotting, solar-system-spanning, drama, intrigue, spy thriller, robo-motorcycle, battle zone was not. I may have brayed reductively that Cyberbikes' parts amount to no whole, and that might be true, but if you cross your eyes, you can see the faint outline of something bigger than the games defining the 3D landscape of the time. Even if this game had no chance of being better subjectively, or even objectively, than Doom or Quake, it wanted to dwarf both of them, both conceptually and physically. That may be giving it too much credit, but we spend enough time praising games that don't need our approval, that succeeded and will be remembered on their massive and obvious merits, that I think I can be forgiven for paying perhaps a bit too much attention to footnotes and alternate histories that never happened. This game is boring and broken on its face, and I don't recommend you spend your time on it, but I can't turn away from it without bestowing my highest level of praise, which is that, by all appearances, it seems to have been ambitious. Doom, after all, never went to our moon. Ambition is really the only thing that ever impresses me about a work of art, so this seals my conviction that the demo really did this game dirty. Both of these games were given a machete treatment that rendered them basically unrecognizable. Imagine if the Final Fantasy VII demo contained no dialogue. Would anyone have bought that? Almost certainly. If Cyberbikes had included Blake down in the demo, it wouldn't have made Warwick any less baffling and unfinishable, but I would have actually been able to complete a mission and understand what the game was. If Fade to Black's demo had included text to replace the missing dialogue, it wouldn't have fixed the awful camera, but I at least would have felt like I was exploring a living world instead of a lifeless, dead coffin. I mean, Fade to Black actually got decent reviews, so apparently someone struggled through it and found a game worth playing. Perhaps I would have too if the demo hadn't been so alienating. That was much less likely for Cyberbikes, but thanks to the demo, there was no chance I was ever going to even try. The shareware concept was much lauded both in and after the 90s, and as far as I know, the concept of game demos is now dead, but these two do suggest that there was a skill set to it, to producing a demo that sold rather than undersold your game. Certainly, in the days prior to YouTube gameplay footage, demos were mandatory, and one wonders if Doom would have been so successful if its demo had been less perfect. The Doom demo was a nearly complete vertical slice that left little question as to what the final game was like, while still leaving enough unsaid that the player wanted to see the rest badly. The glaring lack of a boss fight and the explicit denial of the final two weapons in your arsenal, which remained glaringly dim on your status bar even if you used the all weapons cheat, fed a hunger to see what a boss in this game would look like and what murdering them with those last two weapons would feel like. It made me want to see the completed game so bad my stomach hurt. The culmination of this kind of design was Half-Life Uplink, which for 20 years has shown like a diamond in my brain as the ultimate crystallized ideal of a video game demo. Valve's decision to use a contiguous chunk of cut content was a stroke of pure genius that I'm not sure has ever been replicated. Uplink's vertical slice came not only from the exact center of the cake, but from a different cake entirely. Rather than letting you play the first couple hours of the actual game, as in the same sort of thing magazine reviewers probably saw, it dropped you jarringly into the dead center of the scenario, gave you big guns, and let you even see a boss. It was shorter than the Doom demo by orders of magnitude, but so dense that it got me exactly 50 times more hype for the final version without actually spoiling anything. These examples prove, to no one's surprise, that demos are a good way to sell games, and critically, they didn't remove anything. The parts of the games they showed you were fully intact. So what's the point of this video? Advice. If you're ever a game developer in 1995, remember, your demo can be a small part of your game, but it has to be a complete part of your game. Someday, 30 years ago, you'll thank me for this advice. All right.